Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Castle, manager of the Pender Corporate Bond Fund. I'm pleased to welcome you today to the fourth installment of our Profiles and Credit podcast series, a series of discussions with some of the most influential thinkers, analysts, and practitioners in North American credit markets. In this episode, we are honored with the presence of former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge. Mr. Dodge's illustrious career includes over 30 years at the heart of Canadian economic policymaking. As a senior official in Canada's finance ministry in the 1970s and 80s, Mr. Dodge was involved in many of the critical economic files, including the fight against inflation and the creation of the GST. As Deputy Minister of Finance in the 1990s, he oversaw a substantial improvement in Canada's fiscal position. Appointed Bank of Canada Governor in 2001, Mr. Dodge's seven-year term spanned the events of 9-11, the commodities boom in the mid-2000s, and the early stages of the 2008 global financial crisis. He remains an active voice in Canadian economic circles and is currently senior advisor at Bennett Jones. This podcast is for information purposes only. It should not be viewed as investment advice or as an offer to buy or sell Pender's funds. Our funds are not guaranteed and any discussion of past performance is not an indicator of future results. Any opinions expressed are as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change. Pender may not necessarily share the opinions of our podcast guests. More important information can be found on our website, penderfund.com forward slash disclaimer. David, welcome to the Pender Podcast. Pleasure to be here, Jeff. Um, well, perhaps we'll start uh, uh, at, at the beginning and then and before we get into uh, many of the interesting topics that, that we'll discuss, uh, we can talk a, a bit about um, you know, the origin of your interest in economics and, and why you pursued a, a PhD in, in, in this field. Well, as, as a young high school graduate, I was going to be a chemist and started taking chemistry at university and was taking economics as an option. And that happened to be the time of the huge battle that was going on between the governor of the Bank of Canada and, and the Minister of Finance, Mr. Fleming at the time. Uh, and so I, as I was sitting in my economics class and my professors were writing letters to the government of Canada to say why uh, one Mr. Fleming was wrong and so on, uh, that, uh, that all of a sudden it seemed much more interesting to study economics than to watch OHs run around the page in chemistry lessons. And so that's how I started. Okay, uh, that, that's um, I, obviously an attraction to the action, I, I guess you could say. Well, to the action and, and to something that was immediately relevant. After, uh, I guess, graduating from Princeton and, and spending a bit of time as a professor, you um, came to the Department of Finance, and, and early in your career in, in the finance department world, uh, you served on the Anti-Inflation Board in the 1970s. And in, in that time, the Canadian economy... Uh, was a lot different than it is now. Um, you know, many of us investors who are uh, of younger generations uh, don't really recall dealing with inflation day to day. Can you talk about the issues that drove inflation back then and, and perhaps how the economy was different then than it is nowadays? Yeah. Well, I arrived in finance in 72. That was John Turner's last last. Or John Turner's first year of what turned out to be a, a, an enormous continuing strain of budget deficits. And uh, uh, why was that? And why, why, what was going on at the time? Well, in the United States, uh, President Johnson was trying to fight both a war on poverty and a war in Vietnam at the same time. And so the United States was actually generating a huge degree of excess demand, which was spilling over into our country uh, and was uh, basically around the world, actually, putting upward pressure on prices, uh, sufficient upward pressure that we then had the OPEC cartel uh, and the sharp rise in oil prices after 1973. Um, and... Uh, we had expectations. We'd had inflation for a number of years, and then the expectations of inflation continued. And so it was it was a world of uh, uh, excess demand, uh, true excess demand, but a world where uh, 
uh, the expectations had become slowly formed over uh, over the uh, uh, 1960s um, that prices were going to rise and rise forever. V very different than the expectations that existed right after the war when people thought we might go back to the depression of the 1930s. So, so there was that strength uh, of demand, the recovery in Europe, the recovery in Japan, uh, all at the same time. Um, and it was a world then that was generating a lot of in inflationary pressures, true inflationary pressures. Uh, and so the issue was how do you, how do you deal with it? Well, we hadn't really dealt with it very well um, for a while, and we didn't want to. Uh, employ the standard tools of running up interest rates and taking away the punch bowl. And so we were trying all sorts of things, uh, including uh, wage and price controls in Britain and the United States. And then in October 75 here, here in this country, um, to try to suppress uh, the pressures that, that, that were there. And that went on. That went on through the 70s after we ended with wage and price controls uh, until finally, finally in, in 82, uh, Mr. Volcker decided in the U.S. Uh, and uh, Jerry Bowie in Canada uh, that we had to snuff out uh, this, this inflation using the traditional measure of running interest rates way up. Uh, stagnating uh, st uh, the economy, um, and that that was successful. It was the hammer that, that that hit that nail, but I guess uh, it created other issues in, in its wake. Yeah. And through the through the eighties in the early nineties, um, <laughs> you know, you were in a finance department that had to deal with a really deteriorating fiscal situation in, in right. Canada. It was a deteriorating fiscal situation because interest rates continued to run up faster than we had thought. And indeed, most importantly, that interest rates were much higher than the rate of growth in the economy. So that the past that, that, that had built up, uh, the, the real burden of that past that was rising because interest rates were well above growth rates. And so the share of budget revenues uh, uh, that had to go to servicing past debt kept rising and rising and rising. And so because of that, the deficit kept rising, even though in the latter years of Mr. Moroni's regime, uh, they actually turned on the spending side, turned quite decidedly restrictive, but interest rates were rising sufficiently fast <laughs> yeah, if interest yeah. rates are, are 8% and growth is 3 uh, it's hard to catch up. Uh, it, exactly. The burden of past debt rises. Mm -hmm. And so uh, perhaps you could talk uh, about you know, some of the critical policy initiatives uh, through the 80s and, and 90s uh, that you took at the time and, and, and how, um, how difficult that was to convince people to, to take this medicine. Well... In fact, the, the, the Canadian public, I think, understand better, often understood better than government ministers, uh, the problem that was there. Um, they use the analogy that I can't keep increasing my mortgage year after year after year. Um, and they say, well, therefore, you can't keep increasing the public debt. That's not a fair analogy, but it, it is absolutely true that when interest rates are higher or even equal to growth rates, uh, then the burden of that past debt uh, just keeps rising. Uh, and so somehow intuitively the public understood that so that by the time Mr. Martin uh, became Minister of Finance in, in 93 and then in 94 and five, the public was actually Mr. Martin's ally in trying to deal with that fiscal problem. You know, you think of some of the steps you uh, took, such as uh, enacting the GST, um, the, the proposal to de-index pensions. Um, you know, there was obviously some some stress in your life. Step back then into, into Mr. Moroni's period. 
Mr. Moroni actually, in, in, in certainly in retrospect, should be judged pretty well on the basis of economic policy. That was that was the era of free trade. That was the era when we did tax reform, uh, and that tax reform uh, was quite important. It shifted at least some of the burden of taxation off income taxes and, and on to uh, and on to sales taxes on to the GST. Uh, public didn't like that very much, and Mr. Moroni paid quite a price uh, in the end, uh, electoral price. On the other hand, it was that rather much more solid revenue base, which was better distributed between income taxes and sales taxes or, or, or consumption taxes, uh, that really provided the, the fiscal base that allowed Mr. Martin to do uh, what he needed to do by cutting by cutting the 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 on the expenditure side, uh, we were able and and with a solid revenue base, we were able uh, really very quickly, more quickly than I would have anticipated uh, back in in ninety two or ninety three. We were, we were quite able to get the situation under control. I want to talk a little bit uh, about your time as the uh, uh, governor of the Bank of Canada. But before we get there, uh, a lot of our, our listeners uh, will um, r remember a particular issue, which was uh, the income trusts. And, and they were investors in, in income trusts. And there were a number of changes that happened around uh, that policy over time. Perhaps you could talk about uh, the, the income trust matter as you saw it. Yeah, well, it's an interesting one. I, I was ADM for tax when we initially put those provisions in the act. And we, why did we put the provisions in the act? It, it seemed very sensible. We have depleting assets, in particular uh, oil wells. Um, and the income trust was really quite a sensible way to manage uh, the end of a depleting asset. Um, and so... It, it, that's why we did it. What we had not anticipated at the time is that it would then be uh, through through clever challenges, court challenges, and a number of things that it got spread into absolutely totally inappropriate uh, use. Inappropriate in the sense that the income trust is is for a depleting asset. But most companies you don't want, don't have depleting assets. Most companies you want to grow the assets, right? So it, it was a provision that was really unhelpful from the point of economic growth. It was decidedly unhelpful from the point of view of government revenues once it bloomed. And that's why that had to be uh, brought under control. Yeah, and I, I guess the the denouement of the um, uh, of the sort of the end of the, the income trust was, was probably the um, you know the correction in a number of very highly promotional uh, ventures which were essentially paying out uh, uh, income as a bit of a promotional play and I think the uh, ending that probably helped the markets in the long run. Would, yeah, in, in the end, I think I think both business and government ministers always want to use the tax regime to do all sorts of partic particular uh, things. Tax regime is badly designed for that. And to the extent you try to promote particular aspects of the economy, whether, whether it's housing through, through MERBs as we had at one time, or whether it's a flow through shares for the mining sector or whatever, you end getting into really quite big trouble. Uh, the purpose of taxation in the end is to raise revenues. And if we want to encourage particular industries, and this is a very important lesson, if we want to encourage some particular aspect of the economy, um, then be upfront, do it through subsidy, raise the taxes uh, through general taxation and, and do the subsidy. And give Parliament the opportunity to vote on that. Uh, and then it is absolutely transparent uh, what you're doing. 
So that is a lesson uh, that I learned over many, many years as a, as a public servant, that it's just far too tempting to use uh, these aspects of the tax law to do things because you can hide them away. It's just a little bit of a change of revenue. Whereas if you actually have to go and vote the money uh, to do it, then, you know, that brings public scrutiny uh, and that, that's really, really important. Yeah, I imagine that's a, a lesson that will continue to be relearned by policymakers. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. David, I, I want to talk a, a bit about your time as, as governor of the Bank of Canada. In, in 2001, uh, you were appointed governor of the Bank of Canada. Now, you're, you're a labor economist. You spent a lot of time uh, in the Ministry of Finance. You weren't necessarily uh, a typical pick for the, uh, uh, the, the, the role of, of governor. Was this something you aspired to? And talk about you know, your, uh, your thoughts at the time of becoming uh, governor. Yeah, I mean, I think labor economists end up being very good macro people, whether it's the monetary side or whether it's the fiscal side, because you you begin to you, you spend your life studying how that very important market, the labor market, actually works, uh, and what makes it works and what makes it doesn't work, uh, and so that's why I think. Um, uh, I mean, Janet Yellen came from, from that background as well in, in the United States. Uh, and so labor economics, I think, ends being a very good, uh, very good background training for people that then have to deal with macro problems. I think it, it ends being better training for that than, than perhaps the people that come from the financial side that don't have that sense and continuing sense of how that labor market works, where which so much drives expectations, so much drives um, drives the real economy, and certainly in the end, so much drives uh, the political side of things. So, I don't think it's uh, unusual or, or peculiar, if you will, that that. That that was a background that then took me into public finance. Uh, now, relatively early in your term, you were, I think, appointed in January or February of 2001, and about nine or ten months, uh, I guess, eight months later, uh, we had, you know, uh, the 9/11, and and uh, whatever you were planning on, that probably wasn't uh, in your plans. What do you recall most strongly uh, about that period in, in the wake of 9/11? Uh, I, I recall the day very well. We were at a, a, a meeting of central bank governors in in Basel that particular day. In fact, the meeting had ended the night before, and we were all climbing on planes that morning of September the 11th, Basel time. And um, and I actually made it back on the last plane that landed at Toronto Airport. Um, that day, uh, not knowing what was going on, landed, heard, rushed, f found the last available vehicle to be able then to drive to Ottawa to get back to the bank. Um, one of my colleagues didn't make it. Uh, she was, she ended in Newfoundland. Um, Alan Greenspan didn't make it. Uh, his plane got turned around. What that pointed out was the, how concentrated um, our financial institutions were in, in New York, um, and in particular, the, the Bank of New York, which handled about half of the, um, of the uh, uh, transactions uh, that we're going to at the time. Um, the bank in New York was knocked out, and so people couldn't couldn't get at their money, right? And so, so it was the first couple of days. You know, people were doing everything on faith. It was it was absolutely incredible. Um, uh, in, in order to try to keep going, 
But then what that told us is, boy, we've got a concentration problem, a physical concentration problem. And not just in New York, we had five banks in Canada on one corner in Toronto. Yeah, that's right. Um, right. And so we actually spent the next year, 18 months, policy was in some sense less critical. Well, we spent more time trying to figure out how we can make sure that the financial system can survive, including, you know, if electricity gets knocked out, um, then diesel fuel is very important to keep backup generators running. And so we had to get into the business of Worrying about the allocation of diesel fuel here, at central banks. And- I, I can't imagine that you spent much time at Princeton talking about the allocation of diesel generators. No, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that was that. That was quite a quite a shock, and and you know, every then we absolutely insisted that every bank have offsite with the Bank of Canada. Everything was in our basement. Everything was in our basement. You know, if we if we were it, uh, boy, there was nothing was going to happen through the through the Bank of Canada. So that that was that particular. My memory of of nine eleven was of the physical aspect of trying to to deal with the security of the system. Mm-hmm. But following that, by say two thousand and five, two thousand and six, what was becoming apparent were these enormous global imbalances, uh, largely uh, uh, coming from the fact that the Americans were generating a pretty high degree of excess demand. Um, That was good for us here in Canada. Oil prices were going up and uh, they were buying our exports. We were running surpluses on our current account during that period. Uh, this is the famous sort of twin deficits that the, the U.S. is running, the deep fiscal deficits, deep current account deficits. That- Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, because they were running, in many ways, a repetition uh, of, of what uh, uh, Mr. Johnson was doing. He was trying to run two wars. Here, there was just such an aversion to taxation uh, by the Republican, uh, by the Republicans, that that was generating it, 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 that was generating the problem. It wasn't so much that it were wild spenders, but they were unwilling to tax to match the spending that was going on. Although they were run, running a war in the Middle East at the time, but not nothing on the scale of Vietnam, I suppose. It, it, well, they, they were not focused on uh, on. Uh, let me call it the appropriate fiscal balance, and and uh, and uh, of course the the other thing is that uh, was the Greenspan put uh, the expectation of that the Federal Reserve uh, that the Federal Reserve was um, willing uh, willing to pick up the pieces afterwards of excessive monetary stimulation uh, in order to promote uh, growth in the short term. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this was creating tremendous imbalance out there in the world. And, and there were only a couple of us at the time, the governor of Bank of England and me, who did a lot of speaking. We were not the most popular folks around the table, uh, and certainly not very popular with Alan, because we were arguing that this is a situation that cannot continue, uh, that we really do have to rein in uh, these imbalances. Um, and I had thought at the time that we would end with a currency crisis. And, and what uh, was your prescription, um, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to Mr. Greenspan a, a, at the time? Uh, was it to to lay off the easy money and start hiking rates before they heated? It it it, it, it was what what I don't think any of us appreciated 
uh, no, I can only speak for myself. I certainly didn't appreciate is how um, how much uh, absolute outright fraud uh, was going on in the U.S. in the U.S. Mar mortgage market. It, you know, one certainly said, "Gee, you know, all these new instruments." that were being invented at the time, you know, one, was, one was suspicious uh, uh, of those instruments. As the interest-only loans and the liar loans and the... Uh, uh, well, just, just the instruments themselves, right? They, they were very peculiar instruments. Oh, and mortgage-backed securities and so forth, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, in, in Canada, we had the... the the ABCPs and the equivalent in in the United States, others, where where you could not know the underlying structure in this complex of assets. They wouldn't tell you. Actually, they, they would not tell you what the underlying assets were. Well, they're asset backed. <laughs> you didn't know where what where the preference was in in, in bankruptcy. Um, there was absolutely total opacity uh, about about these instruments. So I guess I it was only by the time sort of I got the winter of two thousand and six two thousand and seven that that I I really began to realize I think we at the bank really began to realize boy there's some there are some potential real problems. Out there, we we're looking at our own in mm -hmm. that regard, but it turned out, of course, this was rampant in the U.S. So, so a lot of the the generation of this excess demand in the U.S. Um, uh, was coming from these instruments, which effectively allowed people to turn their houses into ATMs, um, and basically that that in the end is where we were that I would say as, as a bank and as regulators, we really didn't watch that part of it carefully enough. Although we were watching quite carefully and said, there's a big problem coming. And we were cautious. We were considerably more cautious in this country for that reason. Uh, we can see there's a big problem coming because of these imbalances, mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was kind of my life until finally, in 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 the spring of 2007, or in in, in even it was May that finally realized that these these instruments that are being peddled around. Um, and Deutsche Bank, one of the worst offenders in in the world, these instruments that were being peddled around were re real, real time bombs. Uh, and so we started to move in in August, August 2007. And you were, I guess, specifically in your sites, you had the asset-backed commercial paper programs in Canada in your sites? Or? Yes, exactly. Well, that was our particular problem in this country. I mean, in the U.S., it was much broader, but we had this one, one set of instruments that were, were cockamamie uh, instruments, if you will, uh, and uh, were creating a real problem. Um, well, in the U.S., they had much, many, much more, including, as I said, fraud. Yeah. So. So that was that was kind of the end that as I left and was working with Mark, uh, Mark had been at the bank. This is Mark Carney. I, uh, yeah, Mark Carney had been at the bank and then we lent him, generously lent him to the Minister of Finance. Uh, and so as we were trying to deal in 2007, uh, Mark was over at Finance uh, and we were working together very closely to try deal with this ABCP problem, which then Mark inherited as governor. <laughs> <And> <laughs> finally, 
But finally it got resolved in, in, uh, in December 2008 after, uh, uh, you know, after a very difficult, difficult period. We thought it, we got it resolved a couple of times along the way, but not. So uh, yeah. there's a couple, a couple other uh, uh, issues that uh, you know would have been prominent during your time as governor. One in particular uh, I want to highlight uh, would be you know the, the the trading range of the Canadian dollar, and and you know I guess early on in your tenure, the Canadian dollar at 62 cents uh, that was the lowest exchange rate it ever had against the, the U.S. dollar, uh, and um, explain, you know, how you thought about that. And, um, you know, sometimes people say about central bankers that they may think they control events, but really they react to events. Um, was this something that you felt that you were controlling or that you're reacting to, or you thought it would solve itself? Uh, what did, uh, explain your thinking on the dollar at the time. Well, the, if you think about it for the, the instruments that are in our control, um, which have an impact on what that dollar is. So, so that that low dollar at at that point in time, remember that was right at, at, at really the beginning of two thousand and one, two thousand and two. I can't remember the precise, but it would have been there. That was before, uh, or well. Put it differently. It was after the 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 market collapse of of um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, but before the recovery that really was moving quite strongly, right? And so a dollar, a lower dollar at that point in time for Canadian economy, which was relatively weak in 1990, 91, um, uh, was, was actually, was actually quite appropriate. And so, no, the, the bank does not focus on, on the currency. What it is focusing on is the constellation of policies, monetary policy, uh, the exchange rate, and what's going on on the fiscal side, which governs the aggregate level of demand in the economy. And so the, the dollar is kind of the, the, you don't aim at it, but it, it, it ought to result in, in a floating currency world, which is why we went to a floating currency back in in 1970, um, why we went originally to a floating currency uh, before that. Um, why did we do it? Well, we, we, we did it because the balances of investment and trade flows swing pretty widely. And so it's nice to have something that does a bit of correction. The problem of course, with it is that things work with the lag, uh, and the correction you want may be delayed, or you may be living in the aftermath of what was correcting correction, but it was too much. Uh, well, I think through that period, it worked out that a we focused on on our goal, which was keeping inflation at about two percent. Our goal in doing that was to stabilize the economy. And so when the dollar was very low in the beginning, it, it, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the thing that, that particularly worried because we thought we were following the right policies. And by the time we got out to 2007, of course, everything had strengthened. The dollar was very much higher, right? Right, it was almost, uh, was it ever went higher? Was it 107, I think? Yeah, went well up over par. Um, uh, and th that was appropriate at the time, right? Um, and we had followed sensible policies right right through that And period. it wasn't just that your signature was on the banknotes at that time. 
obviously the recovery in the uh, uh, in in the the broader economy and, and the policies that you had taken in I guess the past decade to put the the fiscal house in order. Right. So so the fact that that we had a rather weak dollar at the beginning when the economy was weak was quite appropriate, and what it meant was that we could pursue rather normal monetary policy, if, if you will, through that period, because the dollar was doing some of the work that needed to be done. And similarly, at the other end, the dollar was doing some of the work that needed to be done. Right, it's exciting. important yeah. to understand that. Yeah, well, let's talk uh, about some uh, some issues in the contemporary I- economy and, and market. Um, and, you know, lately, I mean, it's funny to hear uh, all this discussion of, of the work we did to try and get our fiscal house in order and then to listen to people like Stephanie Kelton or some of these other uh, modern monetary theorists who are talking about uh, a world in which deficits don't really matter. In fact, we ought to be spending far, far more. And the only real check on, uh, on what government spending should be should be whether it, it ignites inflation. What do you think about the sort of modern monetary theorists, and, and, and maybe you contrast it to, uh, you know, someone who might be a more a balanced, a balanced budget kind of conservative person. You, you know, what's the right uh, policy, you know, view for this day and age? Well, remember, remember how basically the economy works. It ends the working between the balance of savings, of desired savings, and desired investment. And right at the moment, for a number of reasons, which I'll enumerate in just a second, right at the moment, we have a relatively high level of desired savings globally. And right at the moment, we have a rather lower level, relative level, of desired investment. Why is that? And why is that so very different than it was in the 1970s? Uh, And I think it's important to understand this. First of all, demography matters. Um, And the age structure of the Western populations, whether it's Europe or North America, a fortiori Japan, and soon to be China, is such that the age structure of the population has tended to move from a low saving set of households to a high saving set of households, just just the age structure. Secondly, income distribution of households really matters because in fact, low income people never save. All the saving is done by the high income people. Well, we have had a big skew since the middle of of, of the 1980s, we've had a big skew in in the distribution of households income, in part because we've had skill bias technological change, which changes the slope of the earnings curve, and in part uh, because we've generated enormous profits, which have generated enormous capital gains, which largely accrue to high income households. So on the household side, there's a lot of saving. On the corporate side, we have moved dramatically uh, to a much more concentrated uh, corporate economy. Uh, And that's not just that there's only about half as many stocks listed today as there were uh, a decade ago, Um, but just pure concentration uh, within industries. Um, And so what we're finding is that a lot of what you might have thought of retained earnings being used for actual investment, i.e. purchasing new plant and equipment, that's not what they're being used for at all. They're being being distributed out in one way or another, uh, or even more importantly, they've been used for further concentration. uh, which simply bids up the price of, of assets without adding to a, additional investment. And so both from the corporate side and from the household side, and this is true in the Western world, 
it's probably a fortiori true in the United States relative to Europe, but it's basically true in the Western world. And it is true in China. And it is true in China. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to generate uh, these big savings. And so the question then is, how do you deal with that? Because if indeed we continue to generate excess savings in the world because of the structure because of the structure of our economy, mm -hmm. then there's a call on governments to fill that up. Because um, I guess the, the normal impulses that would have created inflation or, or some sort of use of resources in the economy, or you know, the consumption is just not as strong as, as the savings impulse. Well, the investment is certainly not as strong as the savings impulse. So you've got two choices. Collectively, we have two choices, let me put it that way. We can either ask government to fill up, fill in that gap, right? We can ask government to fill in that gap. Um, and, and hence, government becomes increasingly important as the allocator of resources in the economy, not necessarily the most efficient allocator, but becomes more important as the allocator of resources. Or we can take action to try to reduce those excess savings or increase, uh, increase on the investment side. What would those actions be? Well, on the savings side reduction, it would be to do something about the distribution uh, of household income. Uh, it would be to do something about the distribution of taxation uh, on labor income as opposed to capital income. I mean, we, we treat capital income much more favorably than we treat labor income. So that, that would be a big structural, structural change on that side, but really quite important. And that would be true if we look at Canada, that would be true if we look at the United States. It is absolutely true if we look at a non-market economy like China, uh, where they have exactly the same problem. They're generating these hordes of savings, uh, which are difficult to, uh, to recirculate in, in the economy. That's interesting. That, that sounds as if you're sort of on the side of these kind of helicopter drop uh, type uh, type distributions to, to households um, that the sort of the modern monetary theorists uh, you know propose. Um, well, be, let's be very careful. I would be much more on the side of taxing the higher income folks higher, right, or putting supports under the income of the lower income folks. You can do that in ways that that don't involve a lot of government uh, redistribution. I mean, you can do it by by appropriate level, appropriate structure of taxation, um, but you can also do it uh, through other means to raise the productivity of folks at the at the at the lower end of the scale. Um, and so there's a so that that is that is. It, it, it is absolutely true that it's the relationship between savings and investment, essentially globally, that are creating this downward, uh, downward pressure. Whether one wants to deal with it through further accumulation of debt, right? Uh, whether you want to uh, deal with it through central banks just printing more and more money to then distribute to lower income folks, which would require that actually the governments distribute it to lower income folks because that's a political decision, uh, not central banks uh, mm -hmm. doing it. Um, or or uh, think of a totally different world in which um, uh, Central banks issue only electronic uh, currency, and we can run negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. 
this is the classic idea that goes back to social credit in the 1930s um, of having dollar bills that lose their value, their purchasing If not value. spent. Yeah, yeah if not yeah. spent, exactly. Um, so, perhaps, uh, you know, you, you raise this issue, and I know in, in 2021, I think the uh, Canada's inflation targeting policy is is set for renewal by the, the, the Bank of Canada, and we have a number of issues. So we, we have this issue of should, should rates go negative? You also, you know, if you listen to what uh, Mr. Powell said at Jackson Hole recently, you get this sort of uh, sense that out of the United States, you, you're actually targeting uh, a somewhat higher rate of inflation and using a bit of sleight of hand to keep rates negative. Um, yeah, but I, I, what are your thoughts going into sort of Canada's you know reassessment of its uh, of its inflation target? Let me frame the issue correctly. Is if you are targeting inflation of two percent or whatever particular number you put in, but if you try, which is essentially low. Uh, low and uh, steady inflation, whatever you're targeting, if you actually are at the lower bound where you can't drive interest rates any lower, right, uh, then in order to hit your target, it, you can't get there just through monetary policy. And so here comes this very interesting idea that you would need an agreement between the bank and the government of Canada, that both sides have to pursue the appropriate policies to hit that inflation target. And when, in fact, we are at the lower bound, where we cannot lower interest rates anymore, unless we were moving to a totally different system where we had central bank e-money and so you could actually have money which lost its value uh, in nominal terms, it's lost its value over time. Mm -hmm. um, then, then the government has to do its part on that side in order to get inflation back to target. And so you can conceive of an agreement which looks qualitatively very different than the ones we've had since John Crow's first agreement with the government in 1989, um, an agreement where the bank and the feds, the federal government, are, are ag agree that they will take the appropriate actions at that uh, at the appropriate time. And so when we're at the zero lower bound, and the bank can't do anything more to get the get it back up to two percent. Then, then indeed, uh, it would be incumbent on the federal government to do something. Similarly, when things get hot, the federal government should have a role as well and not leave it only to the bank to take away the punch bowl. Right? But the spending punch bowl ought to be part of uh, the coordinated policy. Well, uh, we have to think more in those terms if we're in a world where the structure the structure of our economy is such that it's going to generate year after year um, uh, excess savings. Mm -hmm. uh, now, my personal view, this has nothing to do with any official position I'm in, but my personal view is that we should be working on the structured side, that the Ameri we collectively, because on the corporate side, is basically up to the United States uh, to deal with it in our Western system, right? The Chinese, can they can deal with it in their system, um, but it's up basically if the United States doesn't deal with corporate concentration, then it's going to be very hard for the rest of us. We'll try. The Europeans are trying. But it, it's quite, it's very difficult. And as long as, as long as we're in a situation where the price of some things is not priced in dollars, but is priced in the data that you give up 
as a customer. Uh, as long as we're in that sort of situation, which is generating increasing monopoly, increasing concentration of profits, increasing inability to recycle those profits into real investment, as long as we're in that position and unwilling to do anything about it and unwilling to do anything about it, then we have to, unfortunately, expect that governments will have to step in on the spending side and allocate resources on the spending side, which I think most of us that are brought up in, in understanding how markets work think that that is probably not the most effective or efficient way to do things. Yeah, that's the challenge. I want to go back to something we talked about uh, earlier. You, you talked about uh, the Greenspan put back, back in the, the 90s. Obviously, what we're seeing right now, the Greenspan put was only metaphoric. Um, now we're seeing central bank uh, purchases of actual securities in the market. It's a real put in, in that you see uh, not just the, the Fed, but the Bank of Japan and the ECB and even the Bank of Canada now uh, actively intervening in markets for purchases of of government bonds, ETFs, corporate bonds. Yeah, I think the, the Bank of Japan goes as far as to buy uh, stocks on the exchange. The, the Swiss National Bank, I think, is one of the larger owners of, of many of the large uh, North American uh, uh, companies. Um, this was would not have been a tool in your arsenal uh, back when you were at the, the uh, uh, Bank of Canada. What do you think about this? It was the tool. Not that we used in Canada, but it was the tool that the Federal Reserve did use in 2008, 2009. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, this, but I think there are two issues here, and and you really do need to separate them out. It, it's a little tricky to do so, but one is is the role of the central bank in supporting markets, making markets function, uh, market liquidity, and so on. And increasingly, that has moved not just from dealing, making sure that banks function, but that markets more broadly function. And in, in the event of a, a sharp shock, right, that, that is the right role. That is, is what, what they do. They step in and do that. And, and so it's repos and things like that, that that swell the balance sheet initially, because that's how you provide the liquidity to get through that initial shock. That is quite different than a view that, that the central bank ought to essentially just continue to buy government bonds to finance every deficit that, the, that, a, that a government is running. That's a, that's a, a more medium term, more structural sort of sort of decision. And and you know, if we go back again just a little bit of time, and we saw that the United States, the Fed, was starting to run off after after 2016, beginning the process of running off some of that. That that was viewed as um, as you know, the, they've done their job to stabilize, but this was not the permanent way that they were uh, wanting to go. Um, so that that is a, that is a much oh, what's the right word? That it, that is a much more profound debate because you, you can think of stabilizing markets as sort of an extension um, of the original budget principle of what a, a central bank ought to do. This is quite different. And of course, it goes far beyond just buying government bonds. That's right. But, but again, I would say that that, th that is a bit of an extension. We always thought the only thing we needed to do, or for a while what we thought we could do, was to control the whole yield curve by just controlling the overnight rate, right? Um, and and what what we've seen over time, and and whether 
whatever you want to call it, uh, is it effectively to generate the additional credit? Because after all, it's the additional credit that you're trying to generate in order to keep the economy uh, moving, to, right? It's, it's the credit that you're trying to get at. Um, and in order to do that, just working on, on the overnight rate was not as effective a tool and you wanted to use some of the other, so the power of your balance sheet, if you will, in terms of shaping the curve. And that was a little bit more than just the original sort of concept of oper operation twist. It, it was that the structure of the economy is moved in such that you, you need to use that, that, that broader tool. You can think of it uh, in providing the stability to capital markets, but the, the so-called modern monetary theory is trying to deal with this somehow the central bank filling in this hole, right, between savings and investment. And I guess as a former central banker and, and a view it important that the central bank not be the allocator of resources in the economy, that that, that is the role of the market. And to the extent that society wants to twist the allocation that markets bring, that that's a government responsibility. That's not the responsibility of an unelected central banker. Um, to the extent you, you, you want that, then uh, I, I think it's, it's really not appropriate for central banks um, uh, to be in that in that uh, in that business, but how we deal with this global problem of excess savings, um, as I said, uh, is that is not that is not something a central bank can or I would argue should be should deal with. Our audience is uh, a lot of them are, are financial advisors or people who allocate uh, capital on behalf of uh, households and. And, uh, you know, if they're thinking, obviously, they will read the news and there will be a lot of information about the economy. If you're an, an allocator of capital in this economy, what uh, areas of studying the economy make sense to you? Or, or, or what do you think that investors should focus on, either when thinking about the Bank of Canada or, or thinking about, uh, you know, their investments in things like fixed income? So my views on on what is the right allocation, uh, I, I'm not sure are, are, are worth very much, except I would make one one general point, and I think that's incredibly important for this country in particular, uh, because we've been slow uh, in uh, in recognizing that the world has moved to a digital economy. Right? is moved from a physical to a digital economy. Our strength historically has been on the physical economy. Um, and even though we've done some good research work in the digital era, we've not been very good at commercializing that uh, a little bit, but, but not, not, all that, uh, not all that great. You know, lots of stuff uh as has been invented here but commercialized elsewhere uh we've not put the emphasis on on actually capturing uh capturing the rents that come from the ownership of the intellectual property which in fact our firms and and our businesses and our universities have actually done a lot to create. And so if you look at an area in this country, and then I think it's also true in the world, of where you would expect we should be able to get higher returns from our, our 
efforts of investing. It would be in those areas of, of the digital economy, in the areas of where big data can play a role, uh, where, where an analysis of big data can play a role. Um, so if you're looking to the future, right, in a sense, where one would hope that your returns are going to be, they'd probably be much more weighted to the intellectual capital side than it is to the physical capital side. Well, David, uh, with that, um, you know, we obviously have uh, oodles of questions we could ask, but we have limited time. And uh, I, I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for, for appearing on, on the Pender podcast. Um, thank you, David. And, and thank you, listeners. Uh, you can find more resources on our website, penderfund.com. We'll be back in the virtual podcast studio again very soon. In the meantime, stay well. Until next time. Penda is an independent, employee-owned investment firm located in Vancouver, British Columbia. Our goal is to protect and grow wealth for our investors over time. To achieve this, we seek to understand the quality of a business or security, obtain more value than we are paying for, deploy capital in flexible mandates, and mitigate downside risk. We have a talented investment team of expert analysts, security selectors, and independent thinkers. They manage a suite of niche investment funds with active, concentrated portfolios of value-based, occasionally contrarian investments. We invest in our funds too. You can learn more at pendafund.com.